It is a pleasure to be with y'all this morning. I think it was about a year ago, um, definitely this month, that I first came and presented to you and kind of gave you the big picture of what we were going to be doing with One by Gospel Lounge. Um, I'd love to give you a full update on all we're doing, but the College and Career Academy, as Paige just mentioned, has certainly taken traction very quickly. Um, so I'm thankful for the time to share with you this morning what we're doing um, and how we got to this point. So very quickly, I will say I was pleased um, in January of this year, um, Dr. Lockhart of Valdosta City Schools reached out and asked would one Valdosta Lounge be willing to champion and chair this initiative. So he understood the investment that you all had already um, made in OVL. He understood that it was important for the community to work together. And he thought of all the great, fantastic partners we have in the community, that OVL was the right one to lead this. And so I'm thankful for that. And I always want to give him credit for, for um, that faith and what we're all trying to do together. So. I've been in that role working with our steering committee since February in earnest, so everything that you're about to hear has happened since February. So when Patty says it's happening quickly, it's happening quickly. Uh, but I'll uh, move through my remarks. Let's see, how do I, how do I progress? No. There we go. Okay, so I'll just dive right in. Uh, this is our leadership team. And as you can see, it's a good mix of business and industry, um, or those that represent business and industry. This is the, the names that you see listed are our executive committee. We meet weekly, so we are in constant contact with one another, and we are structured around the needs that we would, um, need to address when putting the College and Career Academy in place. So specifically, what are industry partners needing? Um, where are they having gaps in their workforce pipeline? Where are they seeing a lot of job turnover? What are the skills that are missing? Uh, so that's a large part of it. The second initiative is focused on the partnership and operations of the group, and I'll explain more about that. To me, that's the heart and soul of what a college and career academy is. And then evaluation and improvement. How are we going to know we've met success? We have great CTA e programs in both of our school systems, in our community, and certainly across the region. Uh, however, what are our metrics going to be to know that we're responding to business and industry? So those individuals that you see, plus others that serve on those committees are involved in that. Commissioner Evans has been to several of our meetings and serves on our steering committee, so I want to say thank you. And then Paige was also at um, a large industry stakeholder meeting we had about a month ago. So we believe that the College and Career Academy um, really helps elevate OVL's second priority, which is Pathway to Prosperity. Here's what we know about our region. For our effort for the CCA, we're looking regionally. Lounge is important. We're the hub, we believe but so are our surrounding communities. And so we're looking at a 10 county region, seven counties in South Georgia, three in North Florida. The meeting that Paige was at just last month had participants from Florida, Tallahassee, uh, Jefferson County, Madison County, um, and Hamilton County. And so we're continuing that outreach as she said, but one of the things to me that makes really the case for why we're doing this is we know that we have poverty in our community. You see there um, what the region looks like, where Lowndes is in terms of poverty, we're in better shape. Um, than maybe our, our surrounding neighbors, but as a region, we're not doing that great. We're certainly behind the state of Georgia and Florida and in the United States. And so I think we have a responsibility to try to do something about that. The CCA, as you understand what it is, I think I agree wholeheartedly with Paige has the opportunity to do that. When we look at labor force participation, um, you can see where we're at. Not great. That's Roughly 50% of our region is just not participating in the workforce that's able to do so. That's a problem, and it's probably that access point of when do they get into careers, um, their mobility upward, well, uh, several things related to that, and so we need to do something to change those figures. We know our development authority has been successful lately in recruiting business and industry, so we need to be able to backfill that pipeline. Here are some things that um, we also know about our community. A lot of this is centered around wages, right? So we look at our, our average hourly wage here in our, the Valdosta MSA. We're right at $21 an hour, again, behind the United States. If you look at this quote from the Bureau of Labor Statistics in May, we're 29% behind the national average, which I think is, is not great for our community and our region. Again, as we're recruiting, we want to be as strong as we can be. We also have to have the skilled workforce. So this will help with that. Um, so several of you have probably heard uh, the United Way talk a lot about the ALICE report in the last several months. This is a game changer for our state. And what I will say, the big takeaway for me, as I've said in on that, I've been digging into the data, 
this is nationwide, it's not just here in Georgia, but they're looking at households um, survivability is the way I look at it, the living wage, and that's looking at two, two members of the household working. Okay, so this isn't just folks that aren't in the workforce like the first slide I talked about. These are people that have two people in their home working. And this is above the poverty rate. The numbers you see reflected there are poverty rate plus Alice. These are people who are struggling to just meet a living wage. That's their whatever it takes for either rent or mortgage. That is health care. That is transportation. That is child care. So when you look at Lowndes, 53% of our community is struggling, just struggling at the basics. You look at the region, and I just pulled Georgia's counties for this. It, I could pull them for Florida also. Our region's really having a hard time. We know that there's a lot of poverty here, um, and I believe we all have a responsibility to act, and education is the best way to, to get up out of some of these challenges. So I mentioned the steering committee that we've been working with, and as I described to you what the College and Career Academy is, it is a different way of looking at, at education. It is supported by school systems, but it is driven by business and industry. It has a separate board of directors uh, that are business and industry partners. School systems have a seat at the table, but it is those business leaders making those decisions. And so we've been working very early on to figure out well, what are, what's happening currently in our community. This is what we're hearing. We have CTA, but is it is it CTA to a job? CTA to nowhere was exactly a, a quote from one of the members in the room. Really, how can we help target what's needed at, at Moody? What about our growing aviation community? Our grass has put some new programs in place, but are our high schools ready to meet what they're doing? Advanced manufacturing is important. Logistics is important. How can we grab people sooner to the point about juvenile justice? I would say middle grades, even elementary. We've been touring um, CCAs around the state. I'll talk about that momentarily. And the kids we've talked to and that are at Colin Career Academies, other places, that they got excited about the fifth grade. They were able to go tour the one that was in their community in fifth grade. So I do think we have to start younger. Uh, there is still a needs assessment uh, out and available. Hopefully you've all seen a copy of the, the flyer or the link to do it. Um, Anybody, I'll say this, if you employ one person, you are considered an employer. It's important to know what small businesses need as it is large industry. Nonprofits need to respond. We're keeping it open two more weeks, um, and I'm going to walk through the data of that. But this is important. This will, be, this will determine what we teach. This will determine, determine who sits on our board. This will determine the future of how we're going to look at workforce. So here's the early data. Right now, we have 96 unduplicated responses. 277 total, which is great, but um, I'd really love to see that unduplicated number a little bit higher than 100. We're a pretty large community, certainly a large region. Um, so if y'all have friends, colleagues, neighbors that might need to respond to this, please encourage them to do so. Right now, we're looking at eight high demand um, business sectors. Of the ones that have responded, and there's an asterisk here because this is not quite 12,000 12, jobs, I believe that number is higher. Um, the consultant that we've hired that is doing all the data analysis has not quite updated me on where we're at today at this point. This was a few weeks ago, so I put an asterisk there because I believe it's probably higher than that now. But our region, as this number indicates, will be adding 3,200 over 3,200 new employees in five years. And that's over 1,200 new positions, jobs that don't exist. This is not a replacement. This is a brand new job that we've got to educate and train for. So our workforce for our region is going to increase over 50% in five years. That's a lot. But we know we have students that are entering ninth, I mean high school in ninth grade but not graduating in 12th grade. We've got to do something to get them there. Getting them interested in a career sooner is an important piece of that. And employability. The CCA gives them access to employability um, while they're still in high school. So here are the major job titles to date. The majority of um, what the needs assessment is showing is healthcare. That shouldn't be a surprise as we look at the growth that UNC Health is about to have and that they're planning for, um, I think, over, I think by half, 3,000 of those jobs are nurses alone. That's a lot. So, I, you know, we've been talking with, with the health system, we've been talking with Wiregrass, and they're like, 
we have the programs in place, but we need to expand the pipeline sooner. So they they are wholly supportive of what we're doing for this loan. And I do want to bring this up. So Georgia, we all know and we're proud of, has long been the number one state in the nation to do business, right? And we champion that and we're a part of that success. However, in terms of that livability number that I was talking about and how hard it is to make a budget meet, we're 48th in the nation. That's so there's a gap there. Again, we, we have a responsibility to change that. So as I said, this is about employers, not school systems. That's probably the biggest question I've been asked, which school systems are participating, which are not. I will tell you right now, we have four regional partners that have said they will in, beyond but also city schools, which is great. So our neighbors are looking at it. But while it's important, because school systems have to be at the table, they have to agree to the, F, you know, we put an MIU in place where we talk about FTE, that's gonna transfer. That's all negotiable. Y'all you know, understand that better than anybody. This is a negotiative process. A lot of CCAs that do have regional partners out of their system don't even worry with the transfer of ET, FTE if the other schools can transport. If they'll agree to transport and they can make the class, they let the FTE be a wash as long as they can you know, work out the ability to pay faculty and teachers. The other thing that I will tell you that's not going to be on this slide, um, presentation is that a lot of the teachers and CCAs are not traditional educators and that's kind of hard for people to wrap their brains around but they're credentialed industry professionals in whatever their industry sector is so they're paid at a compensation rate that you would see in industry and they teach as an industry they are not they are not through the traditional DOE system so it's very much a business driven approach to education and flexibility is what makes it different so when we put programs in place and we believe um, we're very close to being able to do that based on the needs assessment. If we get, you know, two, three years down the road and our business community saying this isn't working, we need this. We land a new industry that didn't exist when we started. We adapt. It's not a one and done. That board is continuing to look at that process uh, over the lifespan of the CCA. So I mentioned that we visited several. We've been to Commodore Conyers in Albany. We've been to Think Academy in LaGrange and we took a group up to WS Hutchings in Macon Bib. And it's really exciting. They're all different. This is not a one and done cookie cutter situation. They all reflect the business community of, of their communities. So this is a model that CCA, the 4C Academy uses up in Albany. I think it's great. They focus a lot on putting their kids in mixed teams. Um, so you've got marketing students working with robotics, working with ag students to come up with um, Yes, they've got, a gar they've got a garden out in the back of their um, facility, but what they've done with that is they've used their mechatronics team to come in and figure out how to do mechanical watering systems, so irrigation, which is really cool. That's how we all work in the real world, you know, mixing. Um, and then also their marketing and business students have put together a plan. They know they have food deserts in their community. So they put, they've produced over 30,000 pounds of lettuce in one year that they put right back into their school system, which I think is great. So not just their academy, system-wide, and then they're selling what they have, what's uh, additional produce. They've, they've built a, a traveling, um, oh, I don't even know what to call it. It's not a cart, but anyway, they, a trailer of sorts that they pull and they go into those neighborhoods that have food deserts and they sell directly to those individuals. So they're looking holistically at, at everything, not, and that's the best way to learn, right? It becomes real, it becomes something that I've done with and accomplished, and I'm making an impact. So this is their model, and I think it's really great. Uh, I mentioned that we're looking multi-state. There are precedents that for this in the state already. As you can imagine, Muskogee, uh, Columbus Muskogee partners right across the river with Phoenix City, Alabama. Their students come, cross, take classes, and go back. You, another important thing to understand is you retain your base high school. So you're always going to be a wildcat or a red devil or what the case may be for you. You'll still graduate here, you'll still participate in the curricular, but you come in these specialized classes and, um, at the CCA. So obviously Phoenix City is not going to give up, you know, their graduating credentials to Georgia. So I, I like to stress that. The same is true up in Park County. They're partnering across the state line with South Carolina. I would love to see us doing it here in South Georgia. There's several models. I won't bore you with the weeds of this, except to say you will hear a lot of things. Well, Fitzgerald does it this way, and we don't think that's going to work for us. Probably not. They're a standalone community. They're a wall to wall, which means their whole whole high school is part of the CCA. But because we're wanting to be a regional academy, we're going to hope to accomplish this multi district partnership. But there's a lot of ways to do it. They're all. Um, 
they're all effective. It's just how, what is the best fit for your community. So if people ask you those questions or they say, oh, I've heard this, I've heard that, I would encourage you to tell them, please talk with Dr. Lockhart, please talk with Mary Beth or members of the steering committee who can kind of give you some insight on, yes, this is true here, but it may not be true here. This is the governing body. This is uh, kind of help you understand how organizationally it would work. It would be multiple school systems, multiple superintendents, all serving. Um, the, the board of directors would have a responsibility back to them. They will also hire their own CEO. Um, so it would be the page of the College and Career Academy. And when I tell you those CEOs are dynamic, they really are. Um, most of them come from business and industry. They are outward facing, interfacing with the business community. They are raising additional dollars. Um, so it's, it's a really unique model. And typically they have their own principal that is focusing on academics, the direct touch on students, making sure their schedules all aligned as they're trying to get from multiple schools and to the workplace. So here is this map of where college and career academies sit in the state of Georgia. So all the red stars are existing CCAs. Um, as you can see, there's not a whole lot in South Georgia, although we do have a few. Um, Cairo's got one, Fitzgerald, Ben Hill has one, and Coffee County has one. Uh, and Albany, as I've already mentioned, has one. But our swap right here for our contiguous counties does not. It's 26 counties in South Georgia do not have access to this model. So the, the compelling thing for me was when we were in Think, and visiting with their students and their faculty and trying to figure out well, how is this really different. They had a student who had been accepted to Auburn and they go on to a great traditional four-year education and he was doing an apprenticeship with Kia and Kia said to him, hey, we'd love for you to go on to that career path. That's what you want to do. However, we're going to offer to pay for your, you know, one year left to finish your accreditation at Wiregrass and stay on with us. We'll pay you work. We'll pay you go to school. Um, if you would like to consider that. And so the student decided to do that, stay home, help his family, make some money early on. <coughs> and his family was our mate, you know, he was about to go to Auburn, about to be the first one in his family to go to a four-year institution. And they called and they complained. And the CCA said, well, we can certainly understand, but I, I, it's his choice and we think he's going to be well prepared and hopefully you'll see that. So within a year, that particular student stuck in his guns, stayed at our, um, West Georgia, came back was making a $90,000 a year salary by staying where he was because he was skilled, he was, he was <coughs> trained. And the other thing that they said at Think is they, they work with all employers, or their system does, um, and the, the employers will call and say, I need a student, I need this skill level, and they'll say, okay, I've got this many or these two or three, and they'll say, well, are they a Think student? And the big piece with that is the additional training that they do around um, central skills, soft skills, whatever you want to call that, um, to get them prepared. They can all train to a skill, they can all train to the workforce need, but it's those soft skills. And I'll talk a little bit more about what Think does that's different. Um, but culture is a big piece of that. The leadership piece is a big part of that also. When we're talking with our steering committee, this is what they've already said that they want to see happen to make it different. Um, they want it to feel accessible and open and exciting, and most of the CCAs you visit do. There's um, collaborative workspaces for the students across teams to get together. There's lots of light, lots of windows. It does not feel like a high school, traditional high school. In fact, most of them don't have bells or buzzers. Students come and go because they know it's time to go. They're treated like adults. They know their bus is going to be here at whatever time to pick them up. They just get up and leave. I witnessed that myself. It was fantastic. Um, and they're excited about what they're doing. They have ownership in it. And so we want the same things here for our students. Um, and so that's kind of the early feedback from our steering committee. This is the leadership rubric that I mentioned that they trained to at Think. Um, I believe that we will probably put something similar in place. The workforce needs assessment, I ask about those, all of those traits you see listed. Um, the ones highlighted in yellow are the ones that the Think Academy tests on. So you can be making an A in your content area, but if you don't show up on time or you don't let your teacher know, and it's up to them to let them know, to call them or text them or whatever, you can still get a C in the class. They are legitimately graded on the essential skills in every program that they take, which is, again, I think a different B. We're all that way, right? If we're held accountable to something, we're more than likely to deliver. So you all can get involved if you'd like to be. Join Commissioner Evans and come to our meetings. Uh, 
The subcommittees are really where the bulk of the work is happening. The steering committee are things that we do need approved. Um, you probably have heard there's traditionally a, a grant that's put into the state budget every year through the technical college system that goes into their budget. This year was the first time in 17 years the state did not put one in, did not put an allocation in. Uh, as you imagine, we're very disappointed by that. However, uh, we believe, they know that we're working, we're not the only community still working to put a CC in place. The governor does have the opportunity for some additional funding in a supplemental budget. Um, later on or at the beginning of the new year or it could be that the legislature puts the money back in for next budget cycle. Uh, we're not stopping our work because you can become a CCA without the funding. I do want to clarify that. So if the grant cycle was in place, the most you could expect to get is $3.1 million. Y'all know that doesn't go super far when you're creating a new program like this. So the money is a nice incentive, but it's not all the money that it would take. Um, and so even without the funding, we're, we're going to put the program in place. Uh, and then hopefully we'll be successful and prepared when the, another grant cycle comes around. But um, that was a, a disappointment to be sure. But, you know, I don't think that the doors close on that wholly. And also, uh, with our recent trip to D.C., I believe that there was some opportunity to seek federal funding for that. And some early conversations there are happening already, too. So I think the money, because we're doing the right things, will find its way to our community. Um, it's just some pictures of some of the work we've been doing, some of the tours we've been on. Um, so this was cool. This was the 4C visit. We took students and faculty from Medosta um, High School with us. Watching them interact with each nationally award-winning students out of 4C was really exciting. That's when the lights came on. They got excited. They wanted to understand. They had built that robot. That robot won a national award. Is it was just really neat to hear them um, interact with one another and get excited that this could be happening here. And so that's kind of it. I'm happy to, to answer any questions. I know I've talked for a long time, um, but it's something I'm very passionate about, and there's so much detail um, that goes along into creating one of these. But it truly is a partnership. It won't work without the community um, being involved because they have to be in the driver's seat. So that's the biggest thing. I want to thank Paige for for letting me come share some time on your agenda this morning and I'll take questions now or just make myself available later. So any questions? A lot of good information. Yeah. Thank you. Everything moves forward as you're planning for because there's a need there. Yes sir, there really is. And yes sir, I was really pleased to hear <laughs> those other school systems that were excited. Several of them said it's on our radar, but we haven't had the ability to pull it together yet. So we're really, I mean, to me, that's demonstrating a leadership role that, that we can play in the region. They want to come to the table. Tift County, who had had one and let theirs um, lapse for a lot of reasons that are local, um, came to the meeting we had last month, and they're interested again. They, want, they potentially want to partner. They've got a neighbor right next door in Turner County that's looking to put one in place, so they're facing competition for Tiff County support, but um, I still think it's great, and I'm glad that South Georgia is earnestly looking at this. So. I have one, one question um, just pertaining to, um, you know, this new generation yes, uh, and the recent um, COVID uh, whole technology uh, transition that we are underwent. There, there is some of the expectation nowadays work, that working from home is the best thing, and I'm just wondering, is that something that's in your calculation? because a lot of people are living in one state but working in another. And so how does that impact your members? Well, in terms of understanding both employer needs, well, I mean, that's a great question. I don't know, unless that they get the needs assessed and respond to it, which they certainly could, because they have employers. Um, but skills would still be needed. I was a stay-at-home um, employee of ACCG before I joined OBL. And um, the ACCG certainly had skills that they were looking for. They would have been eligible, certainly, to apply to this. So I think that's the biggest thing, and it's a great question to ask. Um, we can train for it if we know about it, but even those that are working remotely, their employers do need to participate in the needs assessment. But the skills shouldn't be that much different. I just know they, they really love the Zoom. They really love the, anything that's uh, virtual. Technology-based. And, and, and the jobs are paying them to do it at home now. So. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That's a great point, and certainly something we can consider another way to access those, those employers that are doing that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay. Any other questions?